Sorry, I've done that before, but we are now being recorded. <laughs> uh, I wonder what that voice in my ear was. So, who are we? Well, Andon Engineering Consultants, we're a family owned company specializing in demolition and temporary works engineering design. We've got, uh, we've, well, we've been around since 1990 and we've, we've got three offices across the UK one in Chelmsford in Essex, uh, one in Newcastle under Lyme in the Midlands, and one in Aberdeen in Scotland. We've worked on some of the largest infrastructure projects in the UK with a specialist role in rail projects, but we also undertake work on nuclear construction and decommissioning, um, specialist lifting gear design, high rise, industrial demolition, um, marine works, basement construction, and forensic engineering as well. Temporary Works is our bread and butter day in and day out from hoardings to complex demolition of high rise structures and city centres. We, we look at it all really. With me today, I'm glad to say that we've got Eddie from Geosynthetics. Um, Geosynthetics are a, a manufacturer of, of soil reinforcement products. Eddie is an experienced chartered civil engineer and a technical manager of a team who's provided uh, me personally with some specialist support in the past as Geosynthetics provide engineering support uh, to their products, which is uh, really quite helpful. Eddie is part of a team who are really pushing the innovation in an in, in area of, of soil reinforcement products and ground engineering and, and producing some exciting stuff and such as uh, value engineered steep slopes and embankments through mechanical reinforcement, which is great because <laughs> that's exactly what we're going to talk about today. <laughs> so temporary works, uh, temporary earthworks retaining structures. Temporary earth retaining structures are required um, to well uh, re retain the earth in the temporary term. There are endless reasons why you may um, need to do this on your site. However, which type of wall you can use can really help the project along. I won't be focusing on permanent works, but uh, used in the, the permanent works that are used in a temporary term, such as piled walls, which are often propped at various levels, etc. But I'm going to focus on types of wall that I often see on site as part of just uh, temporary work solely. So um, I'm going to have a look at some typical typical examples which I've got here. So the first group um, I'm going to group together is, is gravity walls and gravity wall based, which means that they rely on the, the mass for stability. Um, and this first example. Ignoring what I've just said about the permanent works, we don't often see this as, as, as temporary solutions, really, as it requires a significant amount of, of concrete or mass. However, it may be used if it's an existing structure on your site and you wish to repurpose it for additional loadings from, say, a mobile crane operating behind it, in which case you will need, um, it'll be necessary to do, uh, have an engineer to assess that. The next one, uh, the following example is gabion basket wall. This is a series of containers filled with material and then uh, stacked on top of each other to create a wall that it generally leans back um, uh, from the open face, as you can see here. Um, this structure is usually towed in at the base as well and has some form of prepared sub-base to take the increased bearing pressures beneath, that are beneath the wall. An alternative to this solution, uh, which is very similar, but it's to use ton bags and stack those as well to make some kind of uh, like a bag work wall. This option costs um, a lot less, but um, is only usually used in the temporary condition because it's winning no beauty contest. They, they don't look great, but it's serving a purpose and well, that's great, that's fine. That's what it's there to do. Um, in this example here, I, I incorporated an edge protection detail in, in the top basket, uh, just, just to provide some edge protection to um, those that are on the top of the wall. The next, um, is a similar method to the gabion basket, but this is to use the Lego blocks or legato blocks as, as the um, blocks to make your wall. These are like huge concrete Lego blocks that all interlock together. Um, they're precast concrete though, and therefore are quite heavy. Um, and it, you'll need some larger plant to, to maneuver them about, but they are very quick to construct as just like your um, Lego sets that I'm sure you've all got at home. Uh, finally, we come to some cantilever, cantilever L walls. Uh, these operate in similar uh, fashion to gravity walls, but instead of having um, a mass of concrete, um, these walls utilize um, fill to stabilize that back, back toe, which, which sticks out there at the bottom. Um, they're often used as push walls on transfer sites too. 
um, and they can also be flipped around um, so that the toe is facing away from the soil that's retained, but this doesn't really exploit its, its abilities to its full potential. So now onto some, uh, a next group which have grouped under embedded walls. So this covers trenching systems that you can see here with proprietary trench or manhole boxes. Simple trench systems with boards and whalers um, are, or can also be lumped in this category. Um, they're generally used if you need a more bespoke excavation. For example, if the excavation is riddled with services or you, and you have to be very careful. Um, this also includes um, sheet piles as well. So sheet piled solutions can be propped or they can be just pure cantilevers. They can be small sheets installed uh, via an excavator or much larger being installed with um, sheet piled rigs. Um, both the trenching systems and these sheet piling systems are, are very common. King piled, um, king post walls, sorry, are constructed from posts which are then inserted into the ground. And then you have lagging or panels uh, above ground which then retain the fill behind there. These systems are great in the proper application. And you can see from the photo, some concrete panels being installed between the steel, steel posts there. And then finally onto the odds and ends types, which don't really fall into the, either of the above categories. So the first being a combined system, um, it's sometimes required that multiple systems are used together, which is um, often, often the case. Uh, the type of wall selected really does depend on the location and the constraints of the job. Uh, we've also got anchored earth wall solutions. These are excellent. Um, soil nails, back one, sorry. Soil nails or uh, ground anchors, uh, such as platypus anchors, are installed, which then utilize the resistance of the soil to provide that support. But they, may, they must be long enough to reach into the soil and, and, and rely on the soil strength that's outside the failure zone. If the anchors are too short, then it's the equivalent of pulling on the soil that's loading the wall, which is similar to sitting on a branch and, and you know, sitting on the same branch that you'd be cutting off and, and all the things are gonna to come together. And then finally, we have uh, the mechanically stabilized earth structures or um, MSC structures, also known as geogrid slopes um, or walls. So th this is a sloped, um, reinforced with geogrid at regular levels going from the basal layer up and this increases the stability of the soil in that structure. They are built up in layers with the geogrid tails reaching back and tying the soil block together. Um, they can take some pretty high loadings and provide a solution covering quite a vast area as we'll see in uh, Eddie's case study later but they're also really great for minor details such as um, terminating ends of a raised platform, a working platform or a very small batters. This example that I've shown here is at Royal Wharf in London on, on the Thames. Here we used an MSE structure to enable the project to be completed in two phases. The new area was about three meter higher than the existing level. So we created a steep embankment along this phase cut line. The walls needed to be constructed against some kind of former um, we, and we used scaffold in this case. We're, we're, we're gonna show a couple of different cases uh, later on, but this essentially allows you to build layer upon layer as, as a particular layer is only suitable to provide support once all the geogrid in that layer is, is, is tied in sufficiently. On uh, the face of the walls on these slopes, really it, it depends on the application. You can have um, just a, a face left with the geogrid, which is quite often the case in the temporary a temporary term it can be seeded as a soft face or can be a hard face similar to a gabion basket wall it, it, it's really up to the, the application so now we know a bit about the types of walls and before we move on to some case studies i just want to mention a couple of areas to keep in mind when thinking about these these structures and when they're being used on site so um what is failure and what does that look like well there's there's several modes of failure which are illustrated here uh, and all of them must be considered when, when um, we're, we're designing those walls and, and what kind of things can happen on site. So we've got, first of all, we've got the structure overturning itself under the forces of the applied load. So it's, it's global failure of rotation of the actual structural element. Uh, running down the left-hand side there, we've got um, the uplift from buoyancy effects or, or heave at the base from hydrostatic pressure. Now on the right, we've got, Global failures such as the wall sliding, um, 
global slip failure. Uh, the next one down and then the next one down from that is a bearing failure underneath the toe where you get some high pressures if there's not a, a, a sufficient strength in your sub base underneath your wall then you could get bearing failure and then also local failure of, of a particular element of that structure the, the structural part of it failing um, you're only going to be as strong as your weakest link on there so the whole system needs to work together and the difference between local stability and global stability should uh, be taken into account when assessing the the, the global failures because it's not always the larger slip uh, circle that can cause the issue um, it could be a smaller one as, as shown up here so all those critical credible failure mechanisms must be checked a couple of other ones as um, groundwater control uh, to take into account water pressure is, is crucial as water pressures can be very high uh, because water has no shear strength like the soil that we usually retain this can be easily solved by drilling regular holes at the base of the wall to, to drain it effectively. Um, but this simple measure cannot always be used. For example, if you, you can't have all water co coming into your basement, then it needs to be designed um, accordingly. And then the final couple of tips uh, is loose fill behind walls. Um, sometimes walls are constructed in a cutting and then backfilled with loose fill behind. So the soil load in the wall may not be as strong as uh, you may have thought or indeed hoped. Um, it can be misleading if there's a borehole log in say the road behind, or the material behind the wall, but it doesn't pick up the loose fill directly behind it, which is gonna be loading your wall. And the other point is to note of, of high point loads um, that may be applied behind your wall from either building foundations or crane loadings. Um, what the earth retaining structure may well uh, be designed for a blanket surcharge um, of 10 kilonewton per meter squared or 30 kilonewton per meter squared but high point loadings need to be reviewed um, separately as they as they may well generate a, a worse case so there's some little tips then and now i'm going to hand you over to um our eddie for our first case study so um if you'd like to take it away eddie Okay, Doug. Thank you very much, Josh, and good morning, everybody. Well, Josh has just got a picture on the screen there of a fairly typical um, use of geogood rolls over the top of a, a non-woven geotextile um, beneath. The particular geogood there is a biaxial geogood that in that particular case, we're using it for a, a reinforced working platform or piling mat. Um, particular case study that I'm going to present to you uh, in, in a moment is largely focusing on the use of uniaxial geogoods, although it does um, incorporate also an in integrated working platform in the upper meter or so of the of the of the structure. So to kick things off, I just wanted to uh, um, elaborate on that a little bit about the two different types of of geogrids. So geogrids are a uh, a plastics formed into an open grid-like configuration to create apertures between the machine direction, um, referred to in a number of different ways, sometimes MD or warp direction, and also the cross direction, CD, CMD, TD, transverse direction or weft directions. There's quite a bit of confusion I see when I have customers ringing me up as to what all these terms, uh, terms mean, so I've kind of th thrown them in there just for hopefully aid to people's understanding a little bit. Uh, the geogrids are formed in various ways, either stretching in one or two directions, weaving and knitting, um, then coating, or bonding rods or straps together. But um, when all said and done, the, the, the primary function of the geogrid itself is almost exclusively um, reinforcement. But there is this uh, difference between either a uniaxial geogrid, just got some pictures on the screen there of a, of a sample of uh, one of our geogrids, and then a um, photograph below in sh showing how the, the geogrid and the compacted backfill interacts. But a uniaxial geogrid is typically used for creating slopes and walls uh, with strength in one direction only. Uh, that's very, very key. And thankfully, within my sort of 15 or 20 years in this sector of the business, I've only been called to site once where a contractor's put it in, put in the wrong direction and they've had to um, dig it up again and, and reorientate it so that the strength, strength was being mobilised in the correct direction. And luckily, they'd only uh, got as far as the first sort of few hundred mil up in terms of the retaining structure. So uh, it wasn't too much of a, a big deal. But that is very, very important uh, with, the, with the use of the uniaxial geogrid. And these are regularly used with site one fill. 
that's how we can add sustainability benefits but occasionally there might be a case for using it with a, with a granular fill so that's a uniaxial geogrid uh, moving on to the next form of geogrid which was more the subject of our last webinar the piling platforms and temporary works platforms but uh, we will see it in the case study that's to follow and that's to a biaxial geogrid these are much more commonly used for either paved or unpaved roads and also crane mats and piling platforms, as I've mentioned already. And because they have a biaxial strength to them, they have the same strength, that's to say, in the north, south, and also the east, west direction. Um, it doesn't matter which way the, co the contractor installs them on the site, they can be installed um, to fit the roll width uh, and also the geometry of the particular site uh, as good as possible. Uh, to minimise any wastage and overlaps between the rolls and not exclusively but these are most commonly used with granular fills. Okay thanks. Okay so after that just quick slide there explaining the differences between, between the two different types of jig we're now going to focus on the main part of my uh, input to today's uh, presentation and that's the case study of a particular project that we did five or six years ago in mid Wales. Um, so the scheme was called the Elan Valley Aqueduct Scheme um, uh, the key part about this is it's uh, an aqueduct that was built over 100 years ago to bring water um, from mid Wales to, to Birmingham and surrounding areas. The aqueduct itself is 120 kilometres long, discharging some 300 million litres of water every day into Frankly Reservoir, which for those of you that don't know is just to the southwest uh, of Birmingham. The, the section at uh, Bledford where we got involved was the first section um, to be replaced and, and require the construction of a new bypass conduit, um, three metres in diameter and some 1.8 kilometres in length. Okay, so the particular element uh, that we got involved with and hence why it's so relevant to today's uh, webinar was the temporary works. Uh, and in, in order to um, construct this uh, new bypass conduit, um, temporary works formed quite a key element of it. Um, in particular, it required the construction of a level and horizontal working platform. Uh, as we'll see in a minute, that was some 14 metres high and 160 linear metres in length to support uh, not only construction traffic, but also very importantly for our calculations that we did to um, substantiate uh, and verify our, our solution as a, a thousand tonne crane um, that was going to be sat on top of this structure um, to, to, to extract the 150 tonne tunnel boring machine that was boring this new conduit. So some quite significant loads there, thinking back to the load that uh, Josh mentioned on his slides uh, a few moments ago, we had some really, really heavy loads uh, on this particular site uh, to deal with. Again, a key requirement of the project team uh, that they had to meet was they had to hit their sustainability targets, uh, and this required the use of on-site material, which uh, conveniently or not, rather, uh, was some quite marginal fill, as we'll see in a moment. Uh, and this was, had to be done as part of the cut and fill uh, balance of the project to comply with the environmental, environmental requirements and the sort of reduction of the CO2 footprint um, as much as possible. Thanks, Josh. Okay, so here we see a plan view of the site and some nice uh, brightly coloured um, uh, uh, colours here to in indicate where the, where the cut and the fill was um, going to be going on. And at the bottom of that, you can hopefully see the thick blue line uh, that's denoting the 160 metre long, uh, 14 metre high reinforced soil wall that, uh, that, we, that we designed and supplied. And you can see on the bottom right hand side of the screen, the access road that was built in off the main public highway. So we're constructing in quite a visible location um, adjacent to one of the um, main strategic roads through, through, through mid Wales. Okay, so here's a cross, typical cross section th through the site. So you can see the uh, existing um, water main there in, in the middle of the cross section, uh, the existing uh, ground slope there. And if we just relied on the natural strength of the soil, um, you can see uh, the, 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 the diagonal lines there in black. That's the kind of profile that we'd, be, we'd have been able to achieve. Um, and also um, uh, without, the use of, without the use of the geogrid. However, in order to maximise the amount of working room that the contractor uh, required for his, uh, to, to undertake his operations, uh, we needed a much uh, steeper, steeper face to the uh, slope. So this is where the 14 metre high, 85 degrees, so five, only five degrees off vertical um, structure that we got involved. And you can see the gain in land that we were able to achieve uh, by doing this. Thanks, Josh. Next slide. OK, so thinking back to that previous slide, we've now superimposed um, on this the 
um, design solution that we uh, calculated and proposed to the project team and ultimately got approved. You can see there we've got um, the geogrid um, layers that Josh was mentioning earlier, extending from the front face um, backwards. That's a, because of the height of the structure, 14 meters in height, as I've said. Uh, those geogrids are extending 10 meters back from the front face uh, to, to it back, it back into the earth bank um, and installed at 300 mil spacings. Uh, and we've also got a, a detail on the face there of an erosion mat uh, and a steel mesh face to enable us to build these very floppy, flexible geogrid products to the required um, geometry. So what we've got there is we've got 43 layers of our uniaxial geogrid, um, an SGI 120, so a 120 kilonewton geogrid for the bottom uh, sort of three quarters. And then we were able to value engineer it and switch to a, a slightly lighter grade of geogrid, our SGI 60, so a 60 kilonewton product for the upper layers. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we've also integrated um, a, a working platform at the top of the structure, the top 970 mil, um, with a couple of layers of our biaxial high modulus geogrids um, formed with granular material there to uh, take the, load, the, the, the direct loadings of the, of, of the uh, crane and the tunnel boring machine that was going to be sat on, sat on the top. Uh, this structure was designed in accordance with BS 8006, uh, 2010, and also Euro code 7. Thanks, Josh. So just a slide here, just explaining a little bit more about the face detail and how that works. As I mentioned earlier, these geosynthetic products are come in rolls. They're very floppy and flexible. So we need some method of controlling that on site to enable us to, to, to build it to the required tolerances to achieve the required geometry. And, and the way we do that with this particular system is a steel mesh formwork, basically a, a sheet of reinforcing mesh that's cut to size and bent to the required angle. Quite typically, these structures, we're looking at doing them at sort of a, either a 60 or a 70 degree face. In this particular case, um, we wanted to maximize the land gain and it was only a, a temporary structure. So we actually increased that angle to 85 degrees, so a bit steeper than the graphic on the left is showing. Uh, and then on the right hand side there, again, this is a, a typical, this is what we actually did on this on this scheme. We, we actually had the erosion control mat and the geogrid inside the, the mesh face as is typical. Um, but the, what this what the slide is showing, if we're constructing these um, rival mesh structures, as we call them in, in the, the more common um, scenario, perhaps we're looking to have them as permanent structures. And typically these structures will be designed to um, facilitate a vegetated face uh, to, to, the, to, to, the, to the slope. So in addition to the engineering that's going on there, the compacted backfill, typically to enable the, the vegetation to establish and be sustainable, we incorporate a two to 300 millimeter column of topsoil, often seeded immediately behind the slope face as the diagram is showing. But in this particular case, temporary structure coming up nice and steep, getting vegetation to establish at 85 degrees would, would be quite tricky anyway. But in this case, with it being a temporary structure, we weren't really interested in the veg vegetation. We just wanted to get the get the height as quickly and as, if, uh, and as efficiently as we could uh, to get up to the working platform level so that the contractor could uh, just under, undertake his works with the, with the tunnel boring machine and the crane. Thanks, Josh. So this is the top part of the structure that we're now seeing here, the, the, working, the working platform part of the system. And you can see up to layer sort of 40 or the underside of layer 41, we've just got the uniaxial geogrids there at the 300 mil spacings as I've already um, as, already, as I've already mentioned, but then for the top sort of 970 mil, as well as the uniaxial geogrids, the purple lines, we've also slotted in uh, three layers of one of our high modulus uh, biaxial geogrids at, at equal spacing between the uniaxial geogrid. And the key thing there is we've also switched um, because we're building a, a working platform, we've also switched away from the site one material for the, just for the top uh, 970 mil of the, of the structure, switched to a, uh, to a granular material uh, to make sure that the, uh, the, the structure remains as stable as, uh, as is required. Thanks, Josh. So uh, a few more details now about the, the reinforced fill material. Uh, I mentioned earlier it's, it was quite a marginal, mar marginal material, so quite tricky and challenging to work with. So we needed to make sure we put measures in place to deal with this. Um, so it was a dark brown, very clay, sandy gravel, slightly gravelly clay, classified officially as a class 2C stony cohesive material. And there we see the design parameters that we used in our calculations. So a friction angle of 28 degrees, uh, a unit weight of uh, 18 
kilonewtons a cube, uh, no cohesion, um, so a quite a low friction angle and a very big percentage of fines, and that in, in turn made it quite challenging because it made it very susceptible uh, to weather conditions, and is often the case in Wales. Uh, we were blessed with some, shall we say, inclement weather during the uh, construction process, so that gave us some challenges that we had to, to deal with. Uh, the way we did that was by having a, a very um, thorough and detailed specific testing regime for the for the job. So we had plate bearing tests on each layer. That was four number on each layer, and we needed to, to achieve a minimum of fifteen percent CBR. Also, hand vane shear tests on each layer. Three of those core cutter samples to achieve a bulk density and dry density to obtain relative compaction a minimum of 95% and a maximum moisture content of 12%. And then sand replacement tests as well. Uh, and I mentioned the inclement weather and the, the susceptibility of the soil we're using. Uh, it wasn't all plain sailing on the site. There were a number of tests that failed. That's the whole purpose of doing the tests is to check we're getting the compaction that we require. And in the main we did, but in, in uh, uh, due to this inclement weather and the susceptibility of the soil, there were a couple of occasions where we didn't achieve uh, the required results. So the methodology there would be to leave that area in question for maybe one or two days, see if it dried out a little bit and, and retest it. If it still failed, then that particular section uh, would be of, of fill would be removed, put to one side to hopefully dry out a little bit. And then we would rebuild that section, taking fill from a different or a deeper uh, into the stockpile, compact it, and then retest it until we are satisfied that we'd um, achieve the required uh, properties. Okay, so enough of the theory. It's nice to see some photographs and see what it looks like in, in practice. So this is the early stages of the job. You can see on the left-hand side there, because we're constructing this wall already into a sloping hillside, there's quite a, uh, a significant sort of toe in detail, embedment detail, as Josh touched on with some of his uh, um, examples earlier, particularly about the Gabian walls and so on and so forth. But you can see the very first layers of the geogrid going in on top of a, a non-woven separation fabric. And then on the right hand side of the photo, right hand photograph there, you can see we just started coming out of the ground. So that's the 85 degree face. Um, predominantly, these works are, are constructed from the rear, um, as you can see with the, 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 the operatives in the plant there. But we're coming out of the ground and that's the rivel mesh and the, also the erosion control matting that you can just see um, coming up on the, on, the, on the face there on those photographs. Uh, another photograph there, this time from, from, from the back. Progress, construction progressing a little bit. A few points to note on this particular um, on this particular graphic. Um, obviously, we're building a, a near vertical structure here at quite some significant height, and we always want to make sure that uh, the safety of the plant and uh, labour um, involved in, in constructing it. So you can see um, some temporary edge protection coming up there. In this case, they elected to use uh, some some scaffolds, um, a sort of network of scaffold tubes. Ultimately, that's down to the uh, contractor North Midland construction to uh, decide how they're going to do that but we've done these kind of structures quite a lot of on quite a number of occasions before so we were able to offer some assistance to them and say well here's some examples of what we what we've um, seen done before but ultimately it's their decision as to how they want to um, discharge the health and safety um, ob obligations correctly and that's what they elected to use on this site. This particular photograph also shows at the left hand side, left hand side there to the uh, at the back of the uh, what we call the reinforced soil block. You can see a, a drainage geocomposite uh, being put up that batter there. That's to make sure that uh, when we build this, that the reinforced soil block um, remains as dry as possible, and hence um, value engineers are designed as much as possible. Thanks, Josh. So, uh, technology these days, drone footage is is is, is, is uh, photographs are always are always nice. So you can see a nice aerial photograph there of the structure um, and and the proximity of it to the road. You can also see the existing water main uh, exposed there, ready for the uh, connection um, into into the new conduit that's being that's being bored. Okay, so this is getting towards the top of the structure now, but it's quite a nice photograph to show a the uni actual geogrids, how they work from the the, the, the rivel mesh still facing at the, at the front, extending that ten meters backwards. As you can see there, the contractor's done quite a nice job of laying the geogrids out, cutting them to length, laying them out nice and neatly, nice and flat and taut. We don't need to stretch these geogrids, but they do need to be laid flat on the uh, on the surface of the previously compacted layer beneath. And you can see there where they've got the geogrid rolled up. That's just ready to when they're ready, they'll unroll that up to the front face. Up, up that uh, 85 degree face and, and just temporarily throw them over the top um, of, of, of the rivel mesh so they can enable them to build in the 
compacted layers and then fold it back um, when, 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 when they've done so. That's why you can see that the slightly shorter upper tail uh, in the very foreground of that photograph beneath that roll of erosion mat, that's not a mistake. That's not, they haven't put it into the right, uh, haven't put it into the incorrect tail length. That's just the up, short upper tail just to in, encapsulate the layer, the layer beneath. Um, so that's the uniaxial geogrid, and that's how you can see that quite clearly the rivel mesh facing that we use to um, achieve the required geometry with these very flexible geosynthetic products. Thanks, Josh. So here we are. If you recall back to the cross section that we had up quite a number of slides ago, you'll recall, recall that we had 43 layers of, of, our, of our geogrids at 300 mil spacings to achieve the re required height. So you can clearly see the, the uh, the, the, the scribbling on the scaffold pole there. So that's layer 43. So now we're at the top of the structure, 43 meters, uh, sorry, 14 meters up in height. Um, and, and as you can see by the, uh, the backfill, we switched to the granular backfill there. Um, you can clearly see also, um, again, from a health and safety point of view, um, we don't want to be having sort of big ride-on compaction plant right up at the, the edge of a 14-metre high structure, even with the edge protection. So what we typically recommend and what you can see is, is, is happening here is within the first one to two metres back from the slope face, uh, as a, just, just, just an operative there with a, with a whacker plate, just doing the first couple of metres of compaction. And then for the remainder of the sort of 10 metres of the, of, the, of the compaction zone for the reinforced geogrid tails, that's where we'd switch to a much bigger ride-on plant uh, appropriate for the type of fill uh, that, we're, that, we're that we're compacting. So there we go, that's the, that's the finished structure um, with, with the formwork, uh, the, the scaffolding formwork still in place. Um, it was very nice uh, to have this scheme because uh, again, we, we, we know what we do, it's, we, we do it day in, day out, but it's always nice to establish as we did on this particular scheme, a, a good working relationship uh, with, with the project team in particular, the contractor, and that certainly happened on, on this case. Hopefully that uh, showcases our abilities and they then think of us next time they come across a uh, particular scheme. We had quite a nice quote from the site agent on this that uh, to say, that the reinforced earth solution uh, literally enabled the project to make the savings by utilizing site one fill, site one fills as they as they're required to do and providing a working platform for their for their tunneling operations in line with uh, program and he said literally said this would not have been possible uh, without the assistance of, 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 of ourselves and the design that uh, that we came up with so that was a nice uh, vote of thanks for us a bit of a pat on the back and a feather in our cap thanks josh so here we are, another, another drone photograph from above. You can clearly see the reinforced soil wall, just in case you weren't sure we put an arrow there. And, and you can see the platform behind with the, the various uh, construction plants. You can hopefully just see it there, the reception pit. Let's see if Josh just scrolls through to the next photograph, you'll see that's uh, uh, blown up a little bit more. All the various flags of the, uh, of, the, of the team that were involved on the scheme there. And just on the next slide there, there we go. There's the tunnel boring machine uh, breaking through to complete its boring works. So. There's some pictures there, just a few sort of headline uh, notes on the next slide, if we could, Josh, please. Um, the, the theme of these presentations and certainly what we always try and get involved with in, on our schemes is to make our, our solutions as cost effective and environmentally sustainable as possible. Uh, and you can clearly see with this particular reinforced soil wall, that uh, temporary reinforced soil wall that uh, uh, was designed and constructed, uh, this gave us a 68% cost saving of what was at the time the, 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 the scheme on the, on the drawings when we got involved with it. And that was a contiguous pile wall and king post system, um, not dissimilar to a, a photograph that Josh put up um, back at the start of the presentation, we went through the full costing of this, um, uh, the different solutions when the scheme was uh, complete, just to see, just to try and quantify the, some of these benefits. And you can see there that the reinforced soil wall option that went in had a, a, a cost per square metre face of £172 compared with the, the King Post system. Um, that 567 so significant savings there, some 68%. And equally, as was as we all ought to be trying to discharge our sort of duties in our day to day work as, as, as best we can to uh, minimize the environmental impact and reduce the carbon footprint that was particularly pertinent on this particular site. But again, when we costed that up, the reinforced soil wall um, came in at 300, just over 380 tons of uh, embodied carbon compared to 715 tons for the uh, contiguous pile wall king post system so we got a 47 percent saving there um so in total 335 tons uh, of co2 was, uh, was was saved by using using our uh, geogrid based solution this equates to 58 round trips of round, round trips to london to paris by plane or alternatively we'd have had to plant some 524 ash trees um to offset that 
Thanks for that, Josh. So just a few photographs. Uh, as I said at the start of the presentation, this was just a, 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 far, a farmer's field uh, before we got involved. Um, but they needed that's that's the location they needed to, uh, to connect the new conduit into the existing aqueduct. So you can see the photograph on the right hand side during construction. Uh, so five years ago now, this was constructed in eight in an eight week period uh, between April and July in 2016. Um, but it's the whole purpose of today's presentation and this particular job was, was temporary works. So if we just go on to the uh, on to the next slide, if we could, Josh. Um, this had to ultimately this had to be taken down one, once it was all done. You can see some photographs there of them taking it down, and then on the the right the right hand side there, that's the field with just the early vegetation, the early grass just starting up again. But if I drove past that site now, no one would no one would have been known no would have known that no one would have known that we'd been there, which is which is perfect. That's what we're looking to achieve. All of it was taken down. The the geosynthetic elements um, within it were. Um, essentially milled when they in, in terms of the earthworks and they were reused in the uh, reprofiling of the slope the only thing that couldn't be done in that regard was the steel mesh panels but they were all collected up and, and taken away to a recycling local recycling facility i believe down in cardiff so um, a nice sustainable solution um, all the way through so that's the end of the case study thanks very much thank you eddie thank you very much um my case study is going to be on uh, a, a different project out of the, out for the country and, and into the city centre. Uh, so my case study is going to be on Unite Student Tower, um, which is on New Wakefield Street in Manchester. Uh, Bowman and Kirkland, uh, Bowman and Kirkland were the principal contractor. Uh, Curtins were the structural engineers and we were the temporary works designers for the job. Um, this site was very small, um, but it had some very tricky boundaries. So we had the uh, Oxford Road, and uh, Oxford Road Railway Station to the north, as well as a, a street in the middle, a small street in the middle. We had Vodka Revolution Bar to the east side, neighboring property, a river to the south, and um, a, a sloping road, which is used by the adjacent um, car park for access to the west. Uh, the design also incorporated um, a high and low level, which um, also just added to the complexity of, of the mixture of the job. The task was to carry out a reduced level dig to cast a deep piled raft foundation um, that would then form the foundation of the tall tower that is going to be constructed there. So this, this, that Google image on the left hand side is um, the tower partially complete. It's now it's now complete now. There was an existing basement, um, but we were going much deeper than that. So the deep, <coughs> excuse me, the deep basement had uh, two levels and Piled walls need to be uh, installed along the lines which is shown above. And we wanted to create a high level working platform that would not load the neighboring structure because the surcharge loads would be much too great for the party wall because um, the neighboring property also had a basement. So that wall was just um, you know, a standard partition wall. But we also had to provide as much room as possible for the remainder of site to uh, for extra uh, the additional trades to progress with with their part of the work. So this plan illustrates where we had the um, reinforced structures. There's one here and, and one there. So the one on the right was a geogood reinforced wall, and then the other one was a, a reinforced batter. Um, this combination was the favoured solution that took up the least amount of space. Um, allowed for the rig to pile where it needed to go and was also practical to construct. So we'll look at the wall first. This was constructed using the same system of formers that uh, Eddie mentioned. And you can see the little um, illustration of the little red men there in the corner, building layer upon layer, which is also what you saw in detail in, in Eddie's um, case study. Um, constructing this wall here essentially allowed us to create the high level platform and, and not load the adjacent structure. The geogrid tails at the top were then uh, were required to provide a working platform for the pile and rig to operate. It also tied in the top of the geogrid wall and locally increased the percentage of geogrid round where the pile rig was, was going to be piling through uh, the tails as the uh, contig wall. Because the regular, um, uh, oh, that's not come up there, but the, <coughs> excuse me, the regular piling along this line would, would compromise the geogrid. So you can see in that corner there, we, we left some of the tails out. Um, piling through the geogrid um, is acceptable, uh, providing that the geogrid has a high modulus as the geogrid then breaks as you, um, as you pile through it instead of tearing like a, a geotextile uh, would do. 
So therefore you, you end up with a, a distinct hole. But you need to be careful how many layers that you're piling through and, and the centers of the piles as well. In previous projects where we've been installing bearing piles, um, we've used a hit and miss process. Um, this ensures that the concrete starts to go off at least by the time you come back and, and start tearing through the geogrid next to it. And the, the structure was analyzed in a software as well, which uh, called Limit State Geo, which is the results of which are shown here. Um, that meant we could um, uh, ensure that the, the tails were long enough, the bearing capacity was okay, and um, the, the um, type of geogrid selected was, was strong enough to, to make sure the solution worked. So the next solution was uh, the reinforced slope. This is a similar to design to the wall. Um, but the geogrid can be spaced out a little bit more. The, the previous one, the, the, the tails were at 300 centers. Um, this one, they could be spaced out a bit more to 750 centers. You can see there where each layer, what, what, similar to what Eddie was saying, is each layer is, is constructed and then folded back in. And then the next layer on top is, is tied to that, to that um, layer. So it all acts as one whole block. And again, this was assessed um, from the high point loading from the pile rig and, and proven to be suitable. There was a third detail that was required as well, which was at a, a pinch point between a couple of areas because um, there was a step in, in the basement structure. We also didn't want to load the river wall, which was in very poor condition. So the geogrid wall enabled plant and structures to, to load this area right up into the boundary um, at a higher level and keeping the load off of the wall. We had a, a layer of compressible uh, material or um, uh, like loose fill, which was, in, which was kind of put in in front of our wall. So we could make sure that the loading onto that river wall, which was pretty poor condition um, was acceptable. So now um, onto some photos. So you can see here, this is taken from uh, standing from the other side of the river. And you can see that the, um, the high level working platform is it constructed with the batter down there? Um, the building that you can see, I'll use my little pointer, shall I? Wherever that's gone. I'm not sure where that's gone. Anyway, so that you can see that the structure there is um, is not being loaded, even though the fill is, is pretty much right up to it. Um, and, and then the power rig, low, power rig working on top of that platform. Here's the, once the job was done, uh, the piling was installed, then that, that fill could then, it was a temporary structure, so that fill could then be removed. And this is the process of removing that um, geogrid. We also had, you can see in the foreground there, some of the um, precast L walls, which is something, another structure that I mentioned earlier in the presentation. Um, we utilized a, a combination of the um, geogrid reinforced structures and the L walls as well um, for this solution. And then that's, that's the geogrid wall all, all gone and, and removed. And then site could then progress. Once the piles were in, the, the contig piles were in and the capping beam was constructed. We, we then had those two, a high level and a low level step in the structure and that, that all that fill could be removed, um, creating the, the reduced level dig. And that's a picture of, of that reduced level dig there. So you can see the contig piles in the, in the background there and, and um, the steel fixing works being carried out for the um, large raft foundation. So why, were the, why was the geogrid stabilized structures the best solution for this project? Well, it was um, very versatile, versatile, being able to be uh, chopped and changed to suit and adapted on site. It saved a, a lot of space compared to conventional um, batters. Um, the tight footprint of the site meant that we were really hungry for every little scrap of space that we could get. Um, it was a sustainable solution. Um, it could be constructed with, with a relatively small plant um, that they had available on the job, especially because it's a small site footprint. Um, we, we didn't have um, a great deal of a selection of plant that we could use. And then also the system led to the cost savings for the principal contractor. So um, they were all very happy. Um, and that's the structure, um, the tower now, it, it's, um, it it's completed this year. Um, and that's really the end of, of the case study. So um, thank you very much for listening. We'll have a quick break. Um, and if you have got any questions, put them into the Q&A bar and um, we'll answer those shortly. In the meantime, um, we've got to 
a seminar coming up, a webinar, sorry, coming up soon, and that'll be next month. That'll be in um, in June. Um, but we don't know.